So, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining our seminar series, co hosted by Department of Real Sciences and the O'Brien Institute for Public Health. I'm Paul Rongsley, I'm an associate professor here in CHS, and I'm going to be moderating today's session, which we call Care and Learning for Editors Hot Tips for Public Health. So it's going to be a, hopefully a really interactive session, very informative for students here. It's going to be really good, um, especially if you haven't published, if you're thinking about publishing your first paper, but also for our postdocs and our faculty that still struggle to kind of read the minds of, uh, of editors, it's going to be great as well. So before I start, I'd like to acknowledge and pay tribute to the traditional territories of the people of the Kriya Zeb, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, which comprises the Sitsika, the Kukani, the Kainai First Nations. Sixteen of First Nation, and the Stony Dakota, which included the Kinneke, Kreospa, and Kutsan First Nation. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Calgary, like Districts 5 and 6. We're all very fortunate to live in both of this beautiful land. So picture yourself in this scenario, and I'm sure a lot of you have been in this scenario. With students that haven't published, you will be in this scenario, just a matter of time. So you just finished off your manuscript. You spent months and months on it. And this is not just any manuscript. This is the one. Like this is the <laughs> best one we've ever done. The one that's going to change policy. The one that's going to make a splash in the media. So you meet with your co-authors. You decide on a target journal. You then spend a day formatting it for that journal. You spend another couple hours getting the references just right. And you submit. You keep your fingers crossed. And maybe two days later, maybe a week later, maybe a month later, you get a rejection letter from the editor saying, "Thanks so much for the uh, submission." We receive lots of papers every year. We just can't publish this one. Best of luck on the journey. And you're left thinking, what the heck? Why did they mix the boat on this complete masterpiece that we have here? And maybe you use some more colorful language when you uh, receive this initial email. But really, in your mind, you're thinking, how does the decision making process work? And what ends up going out for review? What gets accepted? What gets rejected? And so today, we're going to get some answers for those kind of questions. The current opportunity for our colleagues here that have been on the editorial boards, and they're going to lift that veil, so to speak, on how the editorial process works. So, I have the privilege of introducing two of my colleagues uh, that are not only amazing researchers, but are also on editorial boards. So, first, Catherine King Shire is a professor and is jointly appointed with nursing and the Department of Community Health Sciences. She's well known for her multi methods research that books on cardiac care. And she's part of two different editorial boards, the Journal of Cardiovascular Nursing, the European Journal of Cardiovascular Nursing. And she's been a past editorial board member for the journal, the Canadian Journal of Cardiology, which is sometimes referred to as CJC. And if you don't know Fiona Coombe, Fiona is uh, also a professor, department head for community health sciences, and she's the director of the Health Technology Assessment Unit, which we call the HTA unit at the University of Calgary. She's a leading health policy researcher in Canada, and she's held a previous editorial role with JAMA Internal Medicine. For students that are not familiar with the term JAMA, that's the Journal of the American Medical Association. And she's now on the editorial board for the Journal of Healthcare Policy. So to start off, I'm sure that people have a lot of questions. I'll start with the first question. And from there, I'll open it up to people online, there's people in the room here. The first question, just to get us going, maybe I'm wondering, Kathy, if you want to start this one, if you could provide us with an overview of the editorial process and maybe something that surprised you when you took on your role as a, as a someone editorial. The editorial process actually varies from journals to journals. I think there's there's a lot of them that are very common, but uh, in my experience, there is some variability for sure. So somebody, not necessarily the editor, um, to, takes in uh, articles that are submitted. And um, I want to come back to a point that you made earlier, though, that you make the decision to submit the manuscript to a journal after the manuscript is written. I would strongly suggest you think about the journal first mm -hmm. and then work toward the messaging in the journal. But that's, I had to say it because my brain is getting older and I Get things now. So, so what if usually somebody will take a look and do that first Smith test? You know, did, is this something that fits with our mandate? Is this something that looks like it would, uh, it, it might be of interest to our readers? 
And then it will be sent, if, if the answer is yes, then it's sent out to um, uh, to peak members of the editorial board. Now, here's, here's where it diverges. Sometimes it's not the editor. Sometimes it's somebody else. Um, and also, sometimes it's not necessarily a member of the editorial board uh, that receives that manuscript. Sometimes, I don't, I'm sure you find the same thing, you get these out of the blue requests from journals, uh, good and obscure, um, to, to review. Uh, so it's not always a member of the editorial board that, that does that. Um, so that's generally how it goes. Yeah, you can uh, get one of three kinds of notes, one right off the top, hopefully within a few days, so they're not holding you up. Sorry, this really just doesn't fit with our journal and we, we're not even sending it out to review. That, that's, that's, in a way it's the worst, but in a way it's the best because the queen's done and you can move on to something else. The next one is, yeah, we have these reviews that have come in, um, but thanks, but no thanks. And you look at the reviews and, yeah, that's that's where the power language can come. <laughs> and, and sometimes just a little, you know, cup of tea by the fire or whatever it is that you do to relax and, and reframe. Um, and then the third one is is the yeah, but, and there's usually these a list or sometimes longer than others of all the things that you uh, either must or might like to do in order to uh, to be accepted. So here's the thing. I've been down that path, done basically everything that those people wanted me to do and still got rejected. That, that was irritating. <laughs> but but usually, if you do what you're asked to do, things go very, very well. So that, that's a good thing. Um, as an editorial board member and someone who uh, receives requests to review manuscripts, I think the thing that surprised me is how many times I'm reviewing a manuscript that I don't fully understand. Um, so, and and often, you know, I'll I'll get into this dialogue with the editor or, you know, co-editor saying, "Really, uh, you know, I'm not sure I'm the right one for this." And the answer is, "Yeah, but the last time we sent you something like this, we really appreciated that you noticed this or that." So, I guess one of the things. Um, that I would say about this is it's kind of like grant writing. Make sure you're clear when you write mm -hmm. so that even somebody like me who doesn't know everything that you know um, can look at it and still see the value and, and the key messages and, and you know why it really fits with that journal and, and why I should be a champion for you mm -hmm. and, and not a, a criticizer of you. Yeah, I guess I'll just add a few things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so at JAMA, internal medicine, one of the processes we had after the editorial review and we'd gone out for review and we decided we wanted to sort of make a decision on acceptance or not, which was a group decision for the editors. Mm -hmm. We made that together. And so there was a weekly meeting of editors, um, two hours every week, where as an editor, you basically have to advocate them for the paper that you were bringing forward to be the one that was accepted in a limited number of spots that would be published on a, a bi-weekly basis. And the first question that we had to answer as an editorial board was, what did you learn from this? And why would our readership want to learn that too? So to your point, yes. like critical for those key messages to be, to be there. Um, the other thing, <laughs> talking about the different levels of rejection is, Again, at, at JAMA, we had a written down policy that was focused on um, treating reviewer time and its volunteer time as a scarce resource. And so if we were on the fence about, you know, do we think that this would come forward or not? Do we think it's, we would err on the no side? And, you know, partly because JAMA is such a well-read um, paper and it's kind of highly sought after or has a place to publish research. They were allowed to be really maybe whereas you know some of some other kinds of journals that are perhaps um, not as high in their in their readership, maybe they would have a different perspective. But so really treating re reviewer time as a scarce resource. And so again, like if we get the editor's attention and support right off the bat, it's a desk rejection. So again, that, that's crucial. Um 
The other piece that I just wanted to share, which was a huge aha moment for me as I started in an editorial role, was the business side. So I just brought a few uh, diagrams, and I know you can't read these, but I just wanted to share. Um, so at an editorial board meeting, we got um, we got presented with this as a slide, which is um, percentage of revenue coming in from industry is the blue, institutional licensing is the red, and individual licensing and individual article purchases the green. And you know, we were presented with this as a, a way to track out how the business was doing over time, which, although not the sole responsibility of the editorial team, you know, growth in these numbers was one of the metrics the editorial team was measured by. So really having to think about how are we selling, what are people buying, and they're reading things that are often of like high high interest to to a medical audience. That's not necessarily the same as awesome science. So that was a really important learning for me. Um, and then the other thing again, which really took me out of my depth here is just again, I know you can't read the numbers, but um, we got presented with a slide like this uh, because Java was really trying to diversify their um, suite of specialties that they were hitting on. And so this is just a table where they present the different medical specialties and the number of people registered in those specialties in the US. And we had a conversation around this table about what kinds of journals are already targeting these specialties. Um, should JAMA go in there? Is it a big enough market base for them to tackle? And you might have noticed that the JAMA suite of journals has significantly expanded into things like ophthalmology, um, cardiology, um, and that if you want to check out this table afterwards, you will understand how those decisions got, got made. Um, so a point that um, I, I was totally unaware of before I took on an editorial role, and I think really helped me understand why my masterpiece articles, which should change the world, were not making it into these kinds of things. You ask one more question. You want to open up people online. Um, is it advantageous to actually contact an editor beforehand. So maybe I should have chosen my journal before. And then as I, after I choose my journal, is it worthwhile reaching out to you, Kathy, and say, hey, is this of interest to your journal? Instead of going through the process and waiting for that rejection or that, that movement towards peer review. Is there any advantage to that? It's not something that I've ever done or, or recommend. Mm -hmm. um, though I know that people do. Um, and and. Part of the reason why is that these folks are really busy. Mm -hmm. And and frankly, I don't want to irritate them right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So my thought is let's just follow the process and and uh, you know see where the chips fall. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. That's just been you know what I've done and, and what I've um, advocated for my students to do. Other side. Yeah, it's been Pretty well, pretty mixed, yeah. right? So sometimes, um, like until you read the paper, my own stance as an editor is like, I wouldn't be comfortable unless it's really like it's a very wild idea that's not going to fit. Um, I wouldn't give you a no. I was going to say, well, we'll go ahead, follow the process, submit, and we'll see where it goes. Um, I will just say, if you are going to do that, uh, match your expectations to possible outcomes because certainly that kind of relationship, like you still have a process to go through. Mm -hmm. And I have I've had a few times where um, I feel like I've been very um, cautious in my words, very deliberate, and then an author comes back after their paper has been rejected and say like, you know, now I'm mad at you, you should have cut this off earlier. And I think, well, I, I get that, but you know, yeah. So, now the time to contact an editor, I think for sure, is if you have a, a, an idea, maybe an editorial kind of idea like that you'd like to submit, or um, you know, a short review of, of some sort that falls really outside what is normal for that journal, um, and that that has been a very positive kind of conversation. Yeah. Any questions online? Not yet. No. Great. We've got a lot of people online, but no questions so far. What about? <laughs> In person, does anyone have a question you'd like to ask Kathy? Mm -hmm. 
Do, do you think all journals make it clear when you're talking about the process about um, the, the free selection, you know, no, yes, or um, do they make it clear that this is an outright no, or do sometimes, okay, so there's never the kind of thing that this is what the reviewer said, but I'm going to come back and argue it anyway. It's an outright no, no water coming back to me. Pretty much. You, you know, um, uh, this was a long time ago, but I had a, an article, it, it, the one that I said we did everything that they asked us to do, like, I'm not, I kid you not, we really did, <laughs> and, um, and, and then still got rejected in the end. That, that was worth uh, a really, how did that come about? Um, but it was still, I don't know, decisions made, go away. <laughs> I had one case where the auditors came back to me, and I guess just as context, I would say, so as the editor, my own process, and I know the other editors do this too, like you read the paper first, you make a decision, desk reject, do we want, is this worth pursuing to review? Then you have to go through the process of finding reviewers, which takes a long time. Then when the reviews come back, you have to read the reviews. Um, sometimes I have to like cleanse them. Um, because I want them to be really constructive for the authors. Mm -hmm. Then those go back to the authors. And then I get the revised paper and the response back, which I have to read as well. Um, and then I either make a decision to send it back to the reviewers or just accept it as it is. So like, this is a lot of time for an editor. It takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did have one case where um, it was a reject. And we got out to reviewers and we sent back the responses. and. The authors, you know, addressed most of it pretty well, um, and then got a no for lots of different reasons. It's not a guarantee, yes. Um, but um, the authors then came back and highlighted for us some points where um, they they didn't feel like they felt that there was actually sort of like a foundational conflict between the reviewer's stance in the world and in, in their particular area of science and this new, relatively emerging kind of area and um so we did actually review it again with different reviewers and got some different feedback and it wasn't accepted in the end um so i have had but there was like that's one case so can you just comment on <clears throat> sorry the volume of, of requests you get as an, as an editor or a board member are you expected to do review three papers a week five papers a month like i well, yeah, I'm I'm board. I, I'm currently a board member on CJC and in um, the Journal of uh, Cardiovascular Nursing in the U.S. Uh, they kicked me off the board for the European Journal of Cardiovascular <laughs> Nursing after 22 years. Not they thought maybe change was needed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in, anyway, um, I I can get a request um, probably three times, four times a month out of the two journals. Yeah. For me, my volume is much higher. I get yeah. three to five a week. Yeah. Yeah. That was a job. Okay. Yeah. Huge expectation for your time. Then. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of us um, that are part of journal boards or want to be part of boards, we don't know the expectation that you're getting into. And I guess with Gemma, that's a, it's a lot of it that you're trying to put your day. Yeah. Well, and this, this is the thing, though. Pam was talking about being an editor. Yeah. Yes. I'm talking about being an editorial board member. Yeah, those are very different layers. What kind of information do you like to see in one? So how important is a cover letter? Is it is it what's going to make or break your rent? No, I don't think so. I think it's important if you do no mistake that I I can think it does. So I think people really just get right to the right to the paper. Yeah. What do you think? Same. Like I, I just yeah. cover letters for me because if it says anything other than like you know, this aligns to your readership, then of course, that's that's of course that's why there's so many things. Um, and I have to read the paper anyways. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Question. We have an online question. Um, how do you approach the process of responding to reviewer comments, and what advice do you have for managing and incorporating feedback effectively? I love tables. <laughs> um, it, it's very helpful to, 
um, to see tables. Another way is even just in the text, but what's really, really important is that the words of the reviewer are taken out, not out of context, taken out, put into the table or the response letter, and then the proper response. It really helps to say, you know, if you disagree, um, you, you're allowed to, but but be very nice when you do, and and also, um, you know, be clear about why, and and perhaps for that paper where they were saying it, maybe it wasn't mm -hmm. the best review, they gave a really good argument for that, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think the best thing is is just be really clear that you've attended to every detail that, and you know what you've done and why, and also identify where in the paper that that's occurred. Some um, journals will ask you to highlight it. Some journals will ask you to bold it. You know, there'll be all kinds of things that you can ask to do, but just um, follow, the, follow the directions. Mm -hmm. I think the point you raised is really important. Like it's, it's very easy to get angry at a review, I think, mm -hmm. as, as an author receiving it back. You put your heart and soul into this paper, you thought a lot about it. Um, but on the flip side of it, the reviewer has just given you their time and their wisdom and their thoughts, probably in between like dinner and bed, it's like giving up their Netflix time with their family. Um, and so I think really having that frame as you come to your response letter is important. Like someone just gave you their time and wisdom uncompensated, and that you need to honor that in your response letter. So it's very much like reading a grant review. Mm -hmm. It's the same same thing. You know, people put in their time and, mm -hmm. yeah. and effort and expertise and yeah. yeah. Questions from I wonder how many reviewers are connected, how to make sure of like really fair and how biased the process. So how many reviewers are selected? Is it unbiased? Is it just whoever first come first serve? Is it, is it whoever, I, I think it's a little bit of all of them. You know, what did you just say? Whoever agrees to do it. I think that's exactly where I was going. You know, you start. You know, people will start with the best of intentions of, oh, I'm sure that we need A, B, C, and D qualifications, right? And then you end up getting me instead. <laughs> and like like I was saying, there are times where I, I just don't know the topic area very well, or, or I'm unfamiliar with that analysis procedure. So, you know, it, it's who you get in, in the end. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, totally. I mean, we... Um, JAMA does have like a database of yeah. people who have reviewed before that you can search by keywords or like if you know people who published in that, you can search by their last name and then it um, fans out to other people who have published. Um, but particularly over the last several years, it, it really is about like who says yes and you do the best you can. Um, but it's tough right now to get reviewers and they also have to be um, objective and distance from the author, which depending on the field you're in, if they're small fields, that's hard. Um, so yeah. Do you want to add to it? I was just going to ask, do you, do you send to your, well, there's an editorial board and then the, all the people that you send the three degrees out to, do they get some sort of guidelines about here's our value, here's what you want you to do, and if you have stuff like that, do you think when you when you join an editorial board, there there's um, you know the the ethos, the rules and regulations, you know the the, the meetings that you attend and 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 learn about uh, what what's what. Um, I think there is an underlying assumption for sure that that we all do the very best we can and we do it with integrity. Um, that doesn't mean that it always works that way. I guess I just add on top of that, um, which JAMA and health care policy as well. It, when I first started in academics, it was just like a provide your comments box. And now journals, the interest of journal peers have, have moved to like tick boxes. So there's like often 10 questions like, is this original rated on a scale? It, were the methods well described? Things like that. Um, and still a comment box. Um, 
But I think that is an attempt to at least get some standardized feedback in the context of reviewers being very busy. Um, so that's just like one thing that's like changed. Do you? Yeah, do you yeah. There, there's always a tutorial of some sort, whether it, it's the tick boxes or you know an annual video that arrives in my email or something, just to say, let let's let's remind ourselves of what this process is, what it looks like, what conflict of interest looks like mm -hmm. oh yes and you get to sign out annually for you know keeping things confidential and you know so on and so forth mm -hmm. so you know it, it's not just who's at who accepts there there are a number of uh, checks and balances for what responsibilities we have as well maybe just to add to that so what do you do when you get the reviewers that have the one line this is great mm -hmm. and then the other one that says this isn't so great. And there's 20, you know, 20 pages of comments. How do you manage that kind of dichotomy? Well, that in my mind, um, if if I receive something like that, and and I have, I mean, you do it long enough, you'll receive all of these things, right? Um, I'm sitting there thinking, what's wrong with the editor? Like, what the heck? Because the editor's job, in my mind, is to look at those disparate reviews. And, and give me a little hint, anyone will do, about what to do with this information. <laughs> so I think that's a real miss on, on the editor's part if, if that actually happens. And I'm known for being very straightforward, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, I totally agree with you. And I yeah. think, like, again, talking about the, the intensity of an editorial role, <laughs> it is your job to read the reviews and. And if they are very conflicting, offer some guidance about um, where to pay attention to or which side you're falling on um, as, as the journal editor, that kind of thing. Um, in JAMA, we actually do rate the reviewers. So like, we have reviewers that are black. It sounds like silly to do to people who are volunteering. But for that reason, if you have um, five reviews that are not satisfactory, you're, you're like, so, so here's here's the thing with with these. You can definitely get a G. The the, um, the method section is is really overdone. Like too 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 much detail. You can get the same the same paper reviewed, and the comment is, "Could you just add a little bit more about something else?" And this is where Fiona comes in to say, "No, just leave it as it is." <laughs> So I was just going to follow up um, as I'm an AE for a journal, and it depends on um, where, what platform too. So mm -hmm. on the journal I'm on, it's on Sage. So there are different, the way where they're published also kind of dictates how you uh, um, review, but also, you know, grading the, the reviewers' comments, like are they timely, are they, you know, um, appropriate with their comments and stuff. So the platform itself also dictates and as an AE, we get these reminders to every week, like it's sitting in your inbox. And, you know, in terms of commenting about the length of time, sometimes I'm looking for reviews and it can take four months. Yeah. And so sitting on both sides of it, submitting, no, you know, please, oh, please just to give it a desk reject so I can move on or um, sitting in. But it's impossible to get reviews these days. Um, and you know, and you try to check all those boxes, right? Like, is it you know, like myself, I was like a methodologist potentially, and then somebody in the in the clinical area. But it, and when you're in a smaller field, it's really hard. So keeping that in mind that it gets frustrated, but it's really hard. And the platform that the journal sits in it takes a lot of things too. So it's just out of our uh like um, Use control. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm interested in this. To what extent journals track their their reviewers? So let let's say you have a reviewer gives you excellent reviews. They've done ten in a row. They turn around and submit their own paper. Is there any goodwill <laughs> that gives them any favor? Okay, and then my. I no. Okay. And then another no. question is, um, what are some do's and don'ts of peer review? What's what's a good review? What's a bad one? 
<laughs> Aside from quality, of course. Um, I think a good review is one that starts from a good place of being constructive. It doesn't take much to be kind, even if it's the worst paper you've ever seen. Um, you don't have to say that or I mean, convey that in writing. Um, I think it's important that it's clear that the reviewer has read the paper. And, and I don't mean just line by line, but really understood what it was that the author was trying to convey and where the strengths and where the weaknesses are. Um, so I, I think that those are some hallmarks of, of a good review. A bad review is that heck yeah, um, or heck no, um, or, or just critical of everything. You know, there, there's always has to be something that's not awful. Yeah, I would agree. Like I, for me, I think remembering the whole goal of the review is to help the authors improve the paper, whether it's for this submission or the next one. Um, and so for me, I always, when I'm writing my reviews, I try to be like, okay, like what is the author, like what do I want the author to do? Um, and so I try and be like really concrete of like, you know, check out this reference or, you know, you could rework it this way to think about it or, and so I think for me, having concrete actions that yeah. could help them because it's really not helpful to say, like, oh, your background argument doesn't work. Just like, with no formulas. So, right. Two questions online. We have a couple. Yeah. Um, are there insights you can share on common pitfalls that authors often encounter during the submission process, and how can they be avoided? <laughs> just, I mean, the, the one thing is, is follow the instructions. <laughs> um, and, and this is, this is, as much as that's obvious, um, we've all had a rejection and thought, all right, let's get this thing turned around and, and get on with it. And then you realize that all, uh, you know, your end notes broken and, you know, you're <laughs> fiddling with references or what all. And then you find, you realize that you know, maybe you haven't done everything you were supposed to do in order to get the formatting and all just right. And, and that can be irritating sometimes for, for reviewers to have to point these kinds of things out. So it's important, I think, to make the job of the reviewer as easy as it can be. Um, and, and Yeah, I have a slightly different perspective yeah. on that because actually, it's so much time it, to reformat I know. it in journals. And so I'm actually very lenient on that. Mm -hmm. and it's just like, I, I get it. Like you just want to get your paper out there. And the fact that the references are in like this format, and we need to use, like, I don't really care. Like I get the point. <laughs> um, for me, the I wouldn't say it's a pitfall, but the most common reason that things get desperate, I think, from my perspective, is the I can't answer the what that I want question. And if you make me work hard for it, like I'm a busy person, I have a lot of things to think about. I'm not prepared to spend an hour trying to figure out what I learned from you. So if I can't answer that question when I get to the end of my first reading, you're done. So for me, that really speaks to like having your background rationale well argued about how you're contributing, really focused in your discussion about like why does this matter. Um, and, and it goes back to know your journal before yeah. you submit it. Yeah. Absolutely. Know, know where know where you're sending it and why. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, sort of a two-part. Sachin had a comment and then a dual question. Um, he said he finds it really helpful when the AE provides a summary of key feedback. It helps him know which comments to prioritize. Yeah. And then his questions were. Can you comment on how journals are trying to address demands for volunteerism giving, given burnout mm -hmm. and other challenges in academia? As much as he agrees, we should respect the reviewer's time and efforts amidst competing demands. This process has meaningful impacts for the reach of our scientific contributions mm -hmm. and other career trajectories. Mm -hmm. And he asked if you can comment on the practice of naming reviewers when providing reviews to authors. Mm -hmm. And some journals are uh, um, offering to write letters of um, thanks to reviewers um, annually, 
you know, dear Dean, you know, or, and, and, and this is something that can be used on, on um, academics annual or biannual reports. You know, that kind of thing, um, I think they find sometimes helpful. Um, but there's, there's not really a lot, I think, that can be done. I, I you know, it, it, the reviewers, I, I keep think, getting, you know, I think about CIHR at Hearn Stroke, where, where I've spent a lot of my time, and what do, what do they do to try and get reviewers? And this is just a very limited amount that really possible, other than thank you, thank you, thank you, and and, and being respectful of time and so on. Um, the naming piece is certainly coming up. Um, I haven't seen that issue solved. One of the things that I've noticed over the years, though, is that I see more and more um, uh, manuscripts come to me where I see the authors. I know who the authors are. Um, where very early on in, in my time, you never saw who the authors were, which leads to some other problems, right, in terms of there could be a conflict and if you don't know it, but yeah, I guess I'll just, again, I know you guys can't read this, but this number over here that is the total revenue in uh, the last half of 2016 is 60 million. Um, and so I do, I'm, I'm, I have very strong views on this. And so I hope the, the younger, earlier career folks sort of like put it in context of a jaded reviewer, <laughs> editor. Um, but so like JAMA is making a lot of money off of their journal. Um, and a lot of volunteer activity goes into that. And so for me, when I think about like, how do I want to subsidize the publishing business? I'm not that generous actually with my reviews. Um, and I'm at a point in my career now where I can, can be like that, I think. Um, and so I'm really, really picky. I will only do one review a month max, and I will do it for journals that I'm deeply, deeply invested in the content that they're putting out. Um, I actually don't review the journal. Um, and so I guess I think that it is sort of a broken model in terms of the volunteerism that is built into this and then putting on profits uh, or revenue, excuse me, not all profit of around 60 million. Like that just doesn't. I don't think that model should be sustainable. And the thank yous are super, they're like, they're a base, but it's not, like, it doesn't want to make me want to subsidize this business model anyway. Um, so, and then on the naming of reviewers, like I feel pretty strongly, again, for myself, I actually always put my name on, even if it's not required, because if I'm going to say it, like it's, I'm going to own it. Like, and if you're not prepared to sign your name to it, Think really hard about how you frame that because I think it helps a lot with what we're talking about um, in terms of the kindness. Like, I wouldn't say with my name on it, it shouldn't be in there without my name. So that's my own perspective. Um, so I have a follow up and a quick story and then that leads to questions. So uh, I, I hope you're my editor one day. Uh -huh. um, so um, the since uh, you mentioned there's students who stopped here, one of the things I found really useful is when you are dealing with the r and it's really good to be in the room, even if you disagree. And, and as, as, as I said, a lot of the time has been put into um, doing reviews. So if you can say, I do always send a short note to the interviewer and say, thank you for the comments. I agree with everything you said in the every point. And, and that makes it easy for them. One of the journals actually wanted it. Um, one of the actual changes for the text because sometimes the reviewers work on the whole paper again. So making it easy and being readable is really, I think, it goes a long way. Um, so that would be the follow -up. Now, um, I am an editor and I was on a, a panel for federal grant. It's kind of similar. We had a we had a really, a really interesting proposal when brought to the involved key group of coaches. And one of them was, um, who was, who was like a, a, a specialist in this area of genetics, um, was very honest. Right? So we're, this is very much a social science, the company can tell. So we're talking about Washington politics, right? So 
one editor might say, well, this person could be a reviewer because say we were in because they are you know, an expert on information. But I would say that they would actually be able to use a fair form because they're the political. So I think that what I wanted to question is to me, what do you think of, um, because medical fields, quite a lot of history, let's say, it's all growing in different directions. Like it's really hard. I mean, not every journal has a data book. So, what do you think of the idea of suggesting um, a, a few names for reviewers? So that you can say that look, I have this 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 paper on health equity uh, post COVID yes, very specific and also obscure and maybe um you know have all the information that you've acquired for the instruction and you and then you include the names of like four reviews and it shouldn't be two but if there are two make it like I think yeah, this is who I want to be a review. So make it make it like a list and that they can choose from and like what do you think of that that would be some journals general. ask for that now, mm -hmm. or or have asked. It's it's. I've got two minds about it. To be honest, um, you know, if I haven't published with someone in the last X amount of years and still know them and they'll know my work, I might put the name down, um, because I know that that they'll be friendly. Um, I I might know that there are some people that aren't friendly. And and would absolutely not put their names down, but on the other hand, they might be the best reviewers for that type of paper too. So I, like I said, I'm into two minds about it. Some of it I think might be very helpful to the editorial board, but the other piece is is it'll come with the author's bias right from the get go. So so I don't know. That's my answer. I don't know. Yeah. yeah I, my editorial role now is with healthcare policy, which is a very small Canadian focused um, health policy journal um, that really like, struggles for papers and more small, it's a small community. Um, and it does require that you submit four suggested reviewer names. Um, my approach, because exactly as you said, like you sort of you want to pick someone who's going to um, perhaps give you a rough right. Um, so I try and usually pick one name off that, and then we have to have, we have to have three reviewers in total, and, and then two more that sometimes I'll snowball off those names to try and find people who are published with them or like their papers are like you know in that PubMed links papers like this kind of space. Um, so I I do find it useful as a starting off point, but um, I would be very wary of like approaching all of them to be your entire reviewer pool. Question at the back. Uh, so let's say you you send a paper to a respected journal. They send it out for review. The journal ends up rejecting it, but you got great comments. Let's say you revise the paper, submit it to a different journal with the review from the previous journal. Is that useful at all or persuasive at all? Or should you just send it like a fresh paper? My first inclination would be to send it as a fresh paper. Mm -hmm. um, I have had a situation where I did exactly that, you know, aim high. Yeah. Um, and then went to the next one and, and it, the paper was sent to the, the same reviewer. And they, oh. rec yeah, they recognized the paper and, and went, Oh, good job! <laughs> you know, I see you took my feedback. So you know, it, it, it can be a, a small world, but I, I I don't think it's particularly helpful. My bias is that you don't send the first review out. What did you want to say? Saying to the editor, you're you're my second choice, but <laughs> <laughs> that's an interesting because um, on the opposite side, the journal line, like that's been a discussion with our um board and they are promoting because they want to support many reviews and also reviewers that have taken that time to 
Um, so therefore, you know, it is meaningful. Or, but you know, obviously, we review yeah. reviews, but then yeah, they do just, um, recommend that. Uh, that in general. And the second thing, my question is around compensation or that uh, acknowledgement financially. So there's, I know there's some situations now where um, that if you have been reviewed that you might get a discount on your submission fees or your um, publication fees. And I don't know if you guys can comment on that. So one of the tools that JAMA has, has it as the Journal of Human association and cmaj does this as well um which is the canadian medical association their reward for reviewers is um like cme credits that can go towards the, the professional investment of loan work that you have to make to get your license on any cases um and so that i think for physicians um depending on where you are in sort of your in your day-to-day -day role, I think that can be a very valuable thing, and I'd be interested to hear from some of the physicians. I think for, for most people, like if you're grounded in research, my thought is that you have no problem getting the number of credits you need, but if you're a little adjacent to a research role, I, I think that's probably very valuable. Um, the discount, like again, I think it's a nice gesture. Um, I, I myself have never used that, but like, you do the ten percent, and it lasts for like three months. You're yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like yeah. So it's like one of those things that they like. Right? It signals we value, yeah. it. but it's probably not used that often. I don't know. Do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's also a you know if you do this, you'll have a, a month's uh, subscription to something. You know, the same deal. And uh, frankly, I don't think that ever clips the button. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I was going to add to the uh, Reed's question about you know sending a review to another journal. I think when there's a, and and Mo's comment too. I think when it's clearly a, a second choice journal and they know they're the second choice to another one, I think it can be useful. Like I had an experience where we submitted to the New England last year and we got rejected, but after nice reviews, and so we took those nice reviews from New England and sent them to JAMA and said, here were the nice reviews from New England, you clearly know you're going to be second choice. There's no slight in being second choice in New England. Um, and they, they found that helpful that we provided those. And especially because it was a it was a, an RCT that was being published and we wanted review, like we we had a timeline in which we needed it to publish, like kind of a, a, it was being presented at a world conference. And so it kind of said, we need the review back in the next three weeks. And they said, thank you for sending the reviews. Like we appreciated that. So I think there are circumstances where yeah. it's appropriate. But yeah, I would agree that generally when you're just kind of looking for papers um, and it's, it, in some ways it's unfortunate right because like Mo said like somebody's invested their time in that already why are we as a scientific community going to go look for a whole new set of reviewers and I've, I've had papers that have been reviewed at five different journals you think about that that's like 10 different people have read my paper and it's it's almost a tragedy we don't have a more efficient system for how to do this but yeah I, I think as a you know as a community I think it's wrong but as a scientist who wants my paper published I don't think I'd be shopping out all of my <laughs> negative reviews <laughs> And just on the point about you know financial benefits, uh, the journal that I am an editor on um, is uh, also the journal of our <coughs> national association. So we are now starting to give reviewers, if you review three or more papers in a year, you'll get your conference fee uh, waived for, for the conference next year. So that's a new thing we're starting because we realize that it's, it's impossible to get reviewers. We're trying to incentivize giving people a tangible benefit rather than a 10% discount on your publishing fee. So I think some journals are starting to realize we need to do more, but it's uh, really a starting point. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Canadian Journal of Diabetes. <laughs> That's a great idea. Yeah, um, well, and maybe I'll just pick up on um, that comment about uh, being second choice. I don't think anybody's surprised that they're second or third choice, but just <laughs> own it, you know, and that might be something that you tuck into your cover letter is, you know, where you've taken it and what response you got that to, to bring it with you, that cumulative um, benefiting from the reviewer investment. So that was one thing. The second thing is, um, you know, to Fiona's point about CME credits and, and that sort of thing, um, to any people who are just emerging and submitting papers, See if you can review other papers or see if you can pitch on to your supervisor's team and be part of their reviews. Because it's like so many things that, you know, we write good papers when we, you know, are sitting in that chair and actually reviewing a paper and realizing the kinds of questions that come to mind. 
And then the third thing I just wanted to say is to kind of reinforce something that's been come uh, uh, raised a, a number of times, and uh, it's about reviewer investment. And I would say, um, you know, I've you know I've labored and suffered and poured my heart out, and then I've got back these like you know sort of five pages of feedback and you know major revisions and this and that, and you know you grieve and you go into a dark corner for a while. And then you grapple with it and you go, damn, that's better. Yeah. And then you can actually write back and say, we're thrilled to submit this substantially strengthened manuscript. Thank you for this, thank you for that. And I would say stop in those moments because that can actually be a career highlight. Like those are the moments when I realized that there's a whole network around me that I'll never know who they are and look what they've put into this and then look what it put me through but then look what you get you know on the other side so i think that's the kind of nice sort of uh, element to it do we have time for one yeah. um rosman asked what are your thoughts on having ai do the reviews given that <laughs> reviewers are volunteers <laughs> Well, I've never tried it, but I think it would like really put me in my place to have AI review a paper that I was asked to review because they might do it better. <laughs> yeah, that's I. I don't know if anybody's sort of experimented with that. But, I mean, I think probably the missing piece would be like the really critical reflection. So certainly, some reviews are you know very motherhood and apple pie kinds of things. Um, but to critically reflect on like, what does this paper add? You know, are the methods appropriate? Is the interpretation appropriate? You know, are you missing a reference that's really crucial in this field? I mean, again, I'm not an AI expert, expert so maybe it can do all of those things, but um, I could see perhaps like ChatGPT, for example, putting up some kind of generic thing that you would then add context to maybe. I don't know what others think. Maybe it would be so, just building on what you were saying. Maybe it, it would be good for me as an author to run it through something that's like cool. that yeah. first, yeah. you know, it, rather than just you know sending it to my supervisor or my colleagues or what all. And you know, they, they always get great feedback. Mm -hmm. But you know, AI might do something really funky. Who knows? I don't think you're really worried about that. Because AI might steal your work and yeah. send it to somebody else saying, oh, I meant this over here, and you should think about that. Mm -hmm. So I would be very cautious about giving my unpublished work to AI to look at it. Yeah. 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 Reported side, and they say they keep the information and they can use it to improve charities. So, if you have not published your work, it's not advisable to put it there right. because someone else can steal your work. Those uh, uh, word generation by ChatGPT will be your work that is being generated for someone else before you not get your work out there. The journals will tell you it's not new, but actually you have the original idea of that one. So it's not too good to put it on charge. Yeah. But there are some AI like uh, Grammarly, those ones can be used to do your grammar corrections, but not other generative charging AIs. Because they keep your information. Questions are we we're running the right or the end here? Question. I have one for yeah, yeah. the panel. Can I get to kind of what you were talking about about the revenues? And even being on an editorial board, I sometimes wonder what is the motivation of the editorial board? Like what is their can you get, maybe you can each speak to this? Like why does the journal exist? And you know, we have all the purpose statements, but as the editor, what is your vested interest? Like, what are you trying to do as the editor at a journal? And I think that's something that, as an author, I'm I'm always trying to predict, but I never I never seem to get it right. So I don't know if you can talk about like, what's the purpose from the editor's perspective? Yeah, yeah. Um, so certainly in the context of like the JAMA suite of articles, they're so they they have two very uh, so one is to like lead the conversation on advancing medicine through. Research. Um, and so that's, I mean, linked to revenue, but 
you know, sort of having more lofty goals about the intellectual presentation of them. Um, the other piece is like the JAMA suite funds the AMA association, right? So there is a an expectation of flow through, like the AMA owns JAMA. There is um, editorial independence that you know has been more or less present at different times, and you know certainly with the the CMAJ and the CMA, so the Canadian one, we've seen that play out too. Same thing. The journal is owned by the CMA. It's a revenue generation process for the CMA, and um, that can it does get into tricky water when um, actually, I mean, the same thing did happen at JAMA. They they fired the editor in chief of the JAMA network maybe three years ago for um, some kind of some complex. Um, yeah, but so I think it is very clearly the editor in chief's responsibility to maintain the revenue um, levels of the JAMA suite. So um, as an editor, like my letter of an, um, mandate letter did not have that. It was more around like, you know, the scientific integrity, the, the leading presence of the journal as a voice leading science, um, that kind of stuff. Um, but I mean, this is what we talked about at the editorial board. So it might and so it's about which letter, papers but, will get yeah. the best advertising for our journal. Is that like what they're looking yep. for? Is, yep. Yeah. And picking up the impact factor. Yeah. Yep. Kathy, I don't know what your Do Oh, I'm starting to get really cynical. I mean, <laughs> no. My work here is done. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I'm leaning over to this side more than what I would have maybe when I first came in. It really, you know, I, I think if we take the opposite approach, like JAMA is, and, and New England, you know, super duper, right? But then you've got this plethora of these other journals and, and really, they're just clamoring to make money. They they're never going to get out there, but they're they're, you know, maybe they're clamoring not to lose money too. Maybe that's more it. But I don't know. I think somewhere it's sort of got to stop. Like how how many journals does the world need? I don't know who would stop it. I don't know what the criteria would be. I have no idea. But it just it just seems like it, it's a, a me too kind of thing. We've run out of time. We have one minute left. This has been an amazing conversation. Very interactive. Join me in thanking Kathy and Fiona for a wonderful conversation. And thank you. Thank you for joining. Hope to see you at the next seminar. Have a great rest of the week. And take some food at the back. Where you go. Know,